good morning and welcome to the last talk in this uh, session. Uh, first of all, do the people in the back need me to put on the microphone or can you hear me anyway? I'm okay. If, if I start petering off in the middle of the talk, just let me know and I'll, I'll stick the microphone on. But I'm usually loud enough uh, because I give a lot of lectures in freshman auditorium to have a thousand people sitting in them without a microphone. <laughs> So the room shape is usually better though than for the acoustics. All right, so when they asked me to talk here, I was gonna talk about uh, Raman, fast Raman detection for uh, cancer diagnosis. But then I looked at the uh, uh, sort of topics of the talks in, in, the, uh, in the summer school, and particularly the first talk this morning, and I realized that it already made all the points that I would make in my talk, which is that Raman spectroscopy and infrared are complementary techniques, but both are nice because they're uh, fingerprints that don't require labeling. Uh, interferometry can be a very useful tool to condition your signal so you can get better signals out of your system. And principal component analysis, image analysis, and things like this are wonderful for finally ending up getting uh, you know, like simple color codes, for instance, on images like you saw in a talk this morning. So since all of these points uh, were made, and, and I figured that basically from just looking at the title of the talk, I switched to a completely different topic for this talk. And I'm gonna discuss uh, something in, in uh, imaging that I think is gonna become increasingly important in the future, which is that a lot of the work that we do nowadays in imaging is basically on tissues that are dead, cells that are dead, or things that are generally cut out of pieces and that are you know, dead. And the future really eventually is going to lie in doing these things in vivo, on living organisms. Now we're very far away from the ability of having like a complete three-dimensional map of an organism as it's moving and all the molecular things that are going on in the inside, but that's sort of the ultimate goal, and we're taking steps uh, in that direction. So what I want to talk about really today is uh, how to image spatially, temporally complex living systems where you actually have dynamics going on that you want to resolve, maybe on a you know, slow time scale of seconds or hours, maybe on fast time scales like what I'm gonna talk about here which is more milliseconds or microseconds, and uh, uh, looking at uh, living systems uh, while the proteins and other kinds of molecules are doing their job uh, on the inside. A lot of uh, diseases, of course, ultimately have a molecular origin uh, uh, and and uh, a lot of the things that we do nowadays is to treat things when they've already happened. But again, in the future, you know, we want to move towards uh, dealing with things when they still are in their infancy at the molecular level instead of waiting until we have to actually cut with knives and do things of that sort. So there are two general ways of investigating the dynamics of uh, uh, systems in vivo at the sub-cell or the cell, cell level. One is, uh, given by this example over on the left-hand side from a paper by Ignatova and Girash from a few years back, to perturb the system. You ring the bell and you see what the bell does uh, and uh, <clears throat> you look at the response. And the example uh, that I'm showing you here was a pretty bold idea of uh, trying to measure how the stability of a protein is affected by the environment inside the cell. People have been doing experiments for decades on proteins in test tubes, but you know the question is the cellular environment, it contains, it's very tightly packed, it contains a lot of organelles, other molecules, RNAs, proteins, things that can interact with your biomolecules. Maybe that can have an effect uh, you know, on stability and on dynamics that you don't see when you're doing a simple homogeneous test tube experiment. And so she had this idea uh, uh, with Lila Girash, that you know, I'm going to take some cells and I'm going to bathe them in a denaturant like urea, okay? And somehow the cells are going to survive this, and the urea is going to interact with the proteins inside the cell, and we can actually measure a titration curve as a function of the concentration of this denaturant to see whether in vitro and in vivo you get different curves showing different stability for the protein. You know, the more urea you have to add to a protein, the more stable it is. And you know, bold as it was, it actually worked. You know, it, it turns out cells, at least these bacterial cells, can actually handle some reasonable concentration of certain denaturants, surprisingly to me, but, uh, but it, uh, it worked. And indeed, there are differences in the stability that you get uh, in vitro uh, for this particular protein that she looked at uh, versus in vivo. 
but of course, with this kind of experiment in those pioneering days, you had maybe like our kind of time resolution of mixing things by hand, doing titrations, and we're interested in also being able to look at faster processes in a living environment. Another paper, you know, like in even more pioneering days when peop some people in this room probably weren't even born yet, uh, used, is to use spontaneous fluctuations of the system. So instead of ringing the bell, uh, we all realize that the bell is at room temperature and any bell at room temperature spontaneously jiggles and the, the smaller the bell is, the more it jiggles, right? And the easier it becomes to see. That's the whole foundation of doing single molecule experiments, for instance. And so here the idea was, for instance, to just look at the natural fluctuations of a particle that you might stick, let's say, into a mouse cell and then actually just watch this tracer particle move around by Brownian motion. Except, of course, as you might expect, in a live cell, the motion isn't going to be quite just totally random Brownian motion, for instance. Uh, it might actually be that the diffusion coefficient is length dependent, right? In Brownian motion, it would be length independent, but if you have a complex system that's filled with all kinds of stuff, it might be easier to move over short distances than long distances, and you'll see that when you look at the actual dynamics of the motion. And people were able to do experiments like this already on, you know, again, decades ago uh, inside cells. Uh, the length scale of these processes in this case is, is micrometers, kind of microscope resolution. You're actually looking at the diffusion process itself as the thing that's interesting to you. But uh, nowadays we really would like to be able to get down to be able to study uh, nanometer processes. By that I don't necessarily mean that you're going to have nanometer resolution inside the cell, but at the actual process like two proteins coming together and interacting in a signaling chain that may cause something bad to happen or something good you know, to happen. Uh, you know, those kinds of events really occur on a nanometer uh, length scale. RNA binding to protein, things of that sort. All of these biomolecular interactions that occur in, uh, in living organisms. Uh, it turns out that two approaches are closely related. We've, we know since the 1930s, actually we knew it even before then, but we have an official theory since then uh, by Lars Onsager, is that uh, uh, phenomena that are induced by relaxation where I ring the bell and watch what happens versus cases where I look at spontaneous fluctuations of the system are directly related uh, to one another. You know, I could, for instance, induce a change in the system by applying some kind of a step. I could, for instance, jump the temperature of the system a little bit to see what the response is. I'm mentioning that here because that's the example I'm going to be using in, in the talk, and I could jump the temperature back down. And the system is going to have a certain response time you know, as the temperature jumps. For instance, uh, if there is, let's say, a heat shock response in the system, you know, a protein in the cell that interacts with other proteins to save them from heat death, it may take a certain amount of time for that protein to diffuse there and bind. Right? And you can measure that response. And equally, you'll see a response when you uh, shut your perturbation off again. But of course, uh, even when you don't apply your step, uh, you know, if you have, like, let's say, this heat shock response protein and your other protein, they are diffusing around in there and they will once in a while just randomly make contact with one another. So there are natural fluctuations in that system that occur even when you're not driving it. And these fluctuations are shown by that sort of wiggly line. And big surprise, uh, you know, it turns out that in many well characterized cases and well behaved cases, you can actually take the autocorrelation function of this uh, you know, random curve, basically just calculate the overlap integral of it with itself and then shift it in time. And if it's a random curve, it'll have an overlap integral that's perfect you know, when you don't have a time delay. And as you shift more and more in time, you'll eventually decay down to zero. Okay? And it turns out there's a theorem that says that the autocorrelation function of this random noise here will give you a time decay that's exactly the same time decay as what you get by inducing a perturbation in the system. So fundamentally, you can get the same answers out of just watching things happen spontaneously and perturbing things. Uh, on the other hand, it is often useful to perturb things on purpose uh, simply because you might, for instance, be able to bring the system out of a range of characteristics that the spontaneous fluctuations are frequently willing to get into. And that's actually very important in biology because a lot of things that happen in, uh, in say, a living cell are very rare events. You know, something that binds to something else once in a while, some signaling that occurs once in a while, uh, not events that occur very frequently. And so if you're going to wait for those spontaneous fluctuations, you may have to wait for a very long time for anything interesting to happen. This is, in fact, one of the main difficulties of modern optical single molecule spectroscopy experiments is that you spend a lot of time just sitting there while the system is doing nothing. And then once in a while, it does its little jump and does the, uh, the thing that's interesting. 
interesting. And so that's, that, that would be the idea of why inducing perturbations can sort of speed things up a little bit. So what I'm going to talk about then is uh, looking at protein dynamics in living cells as an example of an application of optical probe and excitation techniques to actually look at dynamics at the molecular level inside living systems. And the technique I'm going to discuss is what I call fast relaxation uh, imaging, which pretty much is what the name uh, says. Okay, so what kinds of effects might you expect uh, inside uh, a living cell as far as perturbation on its biomolecular content is concerned? Uh, well, there's sort of two main uh, effects that people are debating, effects of excluded volume and of course chemical perturbations. So the excluded volume effects simply arise from the fact that the inside of any living system is highly packed. It consists of a lot of surfaces that interact with one another. In fact, actually, they are mostly fractal dimension objects uh, that are inside cells. Uh, and so there is these excluded volume effects. And then there's chemical perturbation simply because in a complex environment like that, again, you have many different kinds of molecules. When a protein functions, it's not like in a test tube where your enzyme catalyzes a reaction, you add one ingredient, and then it turns it into a product. It has to be able to actually do that in a very complicated environment with all kinds of interference and other things uh, going on at the same time. And both these excluded volume effects and these chemical perturbations are going to affect what we like to call the energy landscape of biomolecules. So here's sort of a very simple example of this, and I, should, I, I don't even have to say oversimplified though, because it turns out it's a pretty good approximation for many of the real systems. So let's say that we have a protein that could be in an unfolded state or in a folded state, or a signaling system that could be in a zero state or in a, a one state, and there's basically this ability to switch bistably between these two uh, regimes. So one of the things that uh, the theorists uh, realize, and it's been seen also in experiments, is that if I put a system like this, let's say a protein, into a crowded environment, I'm going to actually switch the relative free energy of these different states. So as an example, for instance, let's say down here I have the protein in a folded state, and here I have the protein in an unfolded state, and the black curve would correspond to what the protein does in a test tube. And I stick it into a crowded environment, and uh, the system has to operate within this excluded volume. What actually happens is that uh, this uh, unfolded state is going to be destabilized. So it's going to go to this dotted curve when you're inside a cell. The reason for this is, is the folded state of the protein is already a very compact state that has dynamics, but not as much dynamics. The unfolded state example on, on, the, uh, on whatever, your left side, is a very dynamical system that you know is a polymer that's branching around and moving around. And it's very different for a polymer to undergo those kinds of motions when it's sitting by itself more or less in a test tube than when it's in an environment where there's all kinds of other stuff around it. These other things confine the dynamics and the motions of the polymer and actually basically reduce the entropy of the polymer. And by reducing its entropy, you're increasing its free energy. Okay? So by restricting the amount of motion and mobility that the system can have, the restricting the number of configurations the system can have, since the entropy is simply the log of the number of configurations, you're uh, reducing its entropy and therefore increasing its free energy. So that's why this goes up. And so then the system could actually be switched by its environment from one state to another in a way that's different from the way the spontaneous switching would have occurred with the system just being in, in isolation. So crowding uh, inside uh, living systems reduces the configurational flexibility of the unfolded state in this example or of any kind of more extended flexible uh, states and allows you to obtain free energy switching. And you can also have chemical effects. I'm not going to get into the details of it where electrostatics or other kinds of effects in the environment will modulate uh, what these energies are going to look like. Now it turns out the eff effects you expect inside living systems are pretty small. We're talking about effects on the order of a couple of kT, you know, one kT being a thermal energy unit, like, you know, 300 Kelvins worth. Um, but on the other hand, as we know from the good old days, you know, of Boltzmann already, populations, right, probabilities, are proportional to exponentials of uh, these free energies divided by kT. So there's actually an exponential sensitivity of the population to a free energy. So changing a free energy by one or two kT doesn't really, you know, that's not a huge energy change, but it'll change a population by a factor of, you know, 2.7 for every factor of, uh, for every energy shift of kT. And 
there are actually, it turns out, a lot of diseases, I'll pick as an example, for instance, let's say ichthyosis. It's a very unpleasant skin disorder that you get because a single enzyme uh, in your body because of a genetic defect has a uh, binding rate that's approximately one third of what it should be. And that's enough to give you deformities like basically fish scales all over your, your body. So, so, you know, there are a lot of things in it or think of just about even, you know, sort of the temperature zone that we find is comfortable, right? I mean, you know, we, we are pretty happy at 20 degrees Celsius, but just going up to 40 degrees is pretty unpleasant, and without clothing going down to zero is also you know, pretty unpleasant. That range is, that's a 40 degree range, right? One KT, as I said, is about 300 Kelvin. That's really a very, very small change, and that's because we are made up of these extremely sensitive systems that have this highly cooperative switching going on that really want to work in a certain type of, you know, very narrow environment. Okay? So the whole uh, story here is when you're dealing with living systems, even pretty small energy tweaks can make a very large difference in the way uh, the system behaves in the comfort level uh, of the system. Uh, another thing is, uh, uh, <coughs> as far as interactions inside cells is concerned, is this question of water. You know, there's 300 milligrams per milliliter of all kinds of stuff. RNAs are, and, and proteins are probably the, the most of the dry constituents. So that's actually a fairly large amount compared to the whole milliliter volume. And it turns out people have shown, and there's a, you know, sort of a lot of work on this. I don't know, maybe I can actually get this. No. <laughs> I guess the animation doesn't want to run, that's okay. Um, uh, basically, there's been a lot of work that has shown that water molecules near biomolecules are very strongly perturbed from the behavior of bulk water. So the substance that we know is bulk water that, that boils at 100 degrees and melts at zero degrees, whatever, it doesn't actually exist anywhere in your the bodies inside your cells because it's sufficiently close to some kind of RNA or biomolecule, whatever, that the hydrogen bonding dynamics, uh, the structure, everything is basically being significantly disrupted. And so cells create their own internal environment environment in which all of these things operate, which again is going to be different from sort of the test tube environment. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I was going to ask about, the, the diversity of the environment, because it's, uh, it looks like it's, in, it's inherent to the, maybe the folding dynamic mm -hmm. processes of these proteins. Like, has any other, for example, any other, any study ever been done where they take away the medium that just have like protein in high vacuum, mm -hmm. and they, they observe these same type of Yes, that's right. So people have actually done experiments like this. It's an interesting question. Where uh, one of the things you can do, for instance, and just to go precisely to the question you were asking, you can take actually proteins and put them in ultra high vacuum. And proteins typically have amino acids on the surface uh, that contain charge, whereas the hydrophobic ones that are uncharged tend to be on the interior. So you will have things like glutamates or things like that on the outside. Okay, and so that's perfect for doing mass spectrometry, in fact. And what you find is when you take these proteins and you leave them at their full charge, like say plus 10, that they will literally blow up in the uh, vacuum because of electrostatic repulsion. Okay? But if I neutralize them by putting like anions like chloride or something on the protein to neutralize these charges, these, the proteins will actually consecutively fold up and form more compact structures again. And many of these kinds of structures that you see in those vacuum experiments look actually very similar to the kinds of structures that you get in the living system. So basically proteins in that sense already have inherently uh, build a lot of their ability to form different kind of structures into the molecule itself. And the question I'm talking about here is how can subtle environmental modulations basically affect this? Okay? So really you should think of it as the molecular system often already has a lot of the dynamics, the potential dynamics and structure built in, and then it's basically being bumped by the environment to achieve you know, different results. Okay, so here's the instrument that I want to uh, describe in a little bit of detail and then give you some examples. And by the way, feel free to interrupt me anytime, uh, you know, with, with questions. I have, you know, I'm going to talk about the instrument and then I have like maybe five or six examples of the kinds of data you can get out of it. And the world will not end if I don't go through all five or six examples if you have, you know, questions on stuff in, in between. Okay, so fast relaxation imaging. The idea here is to actually look at how a living system is going to perturb uh, reactions that occur inside of it, like protein-protein interactions, 
protein folding uh, reactions. And those two are actually sort of, in a sense, the most important examples because you know, most chemical reactions, either the molecule does something by itself or you need to get two molecules together to do something. Now, you could get three molecules together to do something, and that certainly happens. But actually, in most cases, it's really that what really happens is that sequentially two molecules together and then the other two you know, get together. So very quickly, as you go to high body number processes, the probability of all of this happening simultaneously actually decays off you know, pretty quickly. Okay, so how is this experiment going to work? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a live cell. I'm going to talk about these U2OS cells in my example here. Those are basically bone tissue cancer cells. The reason we like these, by the way, is because they're easy to manipulate for amateurs. I mean, we're not we're laser people. We're not you know cell biologists. So, but you could. There's no reason why you couldn't do these experiments. Let's say with neurons, except you would have to cultivate them more carefully uh, to keep them happy and alive. Uh, we're going to transfect the cell with a probe protein that we want to study, and we're going to modify this protein. Uh, so, uh, so unfortunately, the, there are labels here. It is not like infrared or Raman where I can do things label-free uh, with a, let's say, a green and a red label. And I'm going to look at energy transfer between these labels to tell me some sort of low-resolution information, at least, about what's going on with this protein. Like, you could imagine, for instance, if this protein is an enzyme in an open conformation, or if it's an unfolded protein, these labels will be further apart. If it's in a closed conformation, or if it's a protein that has folded, let's say, uh, then these two labels will come closer together. Then there can be energy transfer. So can use a uh, LED or a laser to excite one of these labels, the, the, uh, the, the green one over there. Energy can be transferred over to the red one, I get red fluorescence, whereas if the labels are far apart, this energy transfer cannot occur, and I see instead a green color coming out of the system. Okay, so I'm going to transfect uh, my cell with my test protein, and then we want to apply some kind of, we want to ring the bell okay, in this experiment. And the way we're going to ring the bell is to use a, a diode laser uh, that's basically completely programmable so we can apply any kind of heat profile to the system that we want. Okay? And the heat profiles I'm going to talk about here today in my examples, because I only have, you know, whatever, 45 or 50 minutes, are just going to be simple, like, step functions or sort of multiple steps. But you could imagine, for instance, if you wanted to investigate stochastic dynamics or stochastic resonance, that you could actually apply pseudo-random waveforms or anything that you want uh, to the system. Okay? So we have our protein in the cell. Uh, we're applying this uh, jump of a laser just a few degrees because we don't want to burn up the cell or do anything you know, really bad to it. And this is going to shift the equilibrium for this reaction in that way that I showed you a couple of slides ago. We're applying a step and now the reaction is going to follow suit. And if we can apply our step fast enough, faster than the reaction happens, we can actually time resolve what's going on with the reaction. Right? If we do our laser cranking up too slowly, then we're not going to see you know, anything. So the idea is to, ring the, to hit the bell fast enough uh, that you can actually time resolve the response of the system afterwards. So then what we do is we bring in a, in this case, a blue excitation laser. It's going to excite this uh, label here that I call a, a GFP green fluorescent protein that's stuck to my protein of interest. Uh, and uh, I'm going to detect, I'm going to excite the protein, I'm going to collect fluorescence, and then I'm going to detect uh, blue uh, or sorry, green and red fluorescence from this label or that label. And as I said before, what supposedly is going to happen is that as the protein conformation changes, I might get more green fluorescence or more red fluorescence depending on what these labels are doing uh, relative to one another. Sort of give me a coarse grained piece of information on this reaction. But again, we are now probing a process that occurs on a length scale of a few nanometers. Okay? And we can probe it with at least the fraction limited resolution in, in, in this experiment here because we can actually image the entire cell at once. And as was mentioned already in the first talk, of course, visible cameras are still way ahead of the infrared devices that are currently available. And so if you want to, if you shell out enough money, you can buy yourself a camera that has 25% quantum efficiency, can take data at 1 million frames per second, and can take data at up to 2,000 by 2,000 pixels. Okay. So you get literally microsecond time resolution movies with very high quantum efficiency. Uh, that's if you shell out the $100,000 know, for the, for the camera. Um, okay, so that's basically the sort of overview of, of how the instrument works. So the idea, again, you take a cell, 
you put in a probe protein that's labeled with colors, so you can by color differences tell what's going on. You excite the system thermally with a very fast perturbation, like a jump, and then you look at the response of the system and ask questions like, how does this differ from cell to cell? How does this change in different parts of the cell? Things of that sort, to understand the dynamics of the subcellular level. Just a couple of words, I don't want to say too much about molecular biology here, but what you actually have to do to prepare the system to get ready for an experiment like this is you would take this protein here uh, and encode its gene uh, sequence and then uh, uh, basically encode the gene sequence for this red fluorescent label and for this green fluorescent label at what's called the N and C terminus of this protein. Uh, put this in a plasmid, this one here is called PDREAM 2.1, and that's basically just a little uh, circular piece of DNA that encodes your protein plus all kinds of other crap to make sure things are working right. And you inject this into the cells, and it basically just forces the cells to grow uh, this color-labeled protein that you're interested in in uh, studying. And the good news, by the way, uh, even for laser jocks like us, is that nowadays I can actually just on the computer over the web order this. So, so I just send them the sequence of the DNA I want and there are busy people who make these things and then you just get the plasmid sent back you know, ready for action. So it's actually not too bad uh, nowadays anymore to do these kinds of experiments. And again, the way that the uh, detection system works is I have these two labels, a donor green in this case, an acceptor uh, red in this case. Uh, I excite with blue light, and if they're far apart, I will simply get fluorescence from the green donor. If they're close together, I can actually have non-radiative energy transfer, first or transfer uh, between these two, and then I get red fluorescence instead. So I basically have a sort of distance marker that's gonna be green at large distances and red when I'm at short distances. Okay, so let me talk, so I talked a little bit about what we need to do to massage the protein so we can look at the dynamics inside live cells. Let me tell you a little bit about how we program the dynamics. Uh, so we just use a programmable infrared laser uh, to do any kinds of, you know, as I said, any kind of waveform really that we want. The example I'm showing you here is for instance a stepwise heating waveform where we just increase our laser power in these little steps and we can ramp up in this ex example here from 20 to 80 degrees. Needless to say, in cells we don't do that. We, we go from 20 to maybe 40 degrees or something like that. Like a slight fever is as much as you want to uh, give the cell. Uh, we can actually directly monitor the temperature inside the cell. There's many different ways you could do it, but the way that we do it is we can put a fluorescent dye inside the cell that has a temperature sensitive quantum yield. And so simply by monitoring the intensity of that fluorescence, you can actually tell exactly what the temperature is inside your cell. So you don't have to worry about is the thermocouple the same thing as what's, you know, uh, what's going on inside the cell. And the, as you step up you know, to higher temperature, the data that you see here actually shows you the response of the protein, of the fluorescence. So what happens is the both the green and the red fluorescence decrease, and that's simply because of intrinsic behavior of these labels. They have a fluorescence quantum yield that's simply lower at higher temperature than at low temperature, so fluorescence is just gonna go down. That's not really that interesting. It gets interesting though when you get above a certain uh, temperature uh, in your program, you begin to see these two things diverge. You get more and more green fluorescence and the red fluorescence is dropping off. And that's because what's happening is your protein at the higher temperature is now forced to unfold in this case. And so that liberates the green to fluorescence instead of doing the energy transfer. So that's with the two part ways. And that gives us the information about the fact that this protein is actually undergoing folding, unfolding dynamics inside the cell. And we can then take basically the difference between these traces or the ratio, or there's different ways you can plot it here. I'm actually plotting the ratio of the donor over acceptor. And you can plot out these traces where the protein is basically folded at low temperature, it's unfolded at high temperature, and then there's this sigmoid shape transition that occurs between uh, the low and high temperature. And conventionally, we like to call the middle of this curve where it flips over from one to the other, the melting temperature of the protein, or Tm. Okay? So we can determine the uh, Tm of the protein. Mm -hmm. so first, do you need an optical tweezers, a high focus to like, uh, drop one? Um, so you could actually do these experiments with optical tweezers if you want to do them at the single molecule level. We do them actually at, uh, and I'll get into that in, 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 a, in a second, in, in each pixel that, in, that we image in the cell, like one by one micron, we can do the experiment anywhere from about 50 proteins to tens of thousands of, of proteins. You, want to do, you don't want to do much more than that because otherwise your cell just becomes a bag that's filled with your probe protein. The probe protein is supposed to be a probe, so you don't want too much of it. But at the lower concentration end where you have maybe 50 proteins, 
uh, you can actually see fluctuations that arise from the, mo you know, like if I have only 50 proteins and they're moving back and forth between pixels, you'll actually see population fluctuations and you can use the time scale of these fluctuations to measure diffusion coefficients, for instance. So it turns out actually by doing few molecule spectroscopy instead of single molecule spectroscopy, the way you would do with a tweezer where you grab, let's say, a protein, hook it up to a DNA and just stick it between two glass balls on a tweezer, um, you can actually get a lot of that same kind of information because ultimately, right, I mean, when I have 10 billion molecules, I can't see the fluctuations because, you know, they, they be, the fluctuations become very small compared to the number of molecules. And if I have one molecule, I get the full 100%. But, you know, if you have 50 molecules, you get a fairly reasonable amount of fluctuation already. So that's basically as far as we take that right now. So we're not actually grabbing things inside the cells with optical tweezers at this point, although we do experiments like that in vitro, but I'm talking about the stuff we do in cells. Right now. Uh, I see no reason, by the way, though, that you couldn't actually put uh, beads inside cells if you can get enough of a refractive index contrast that you can actually get the necessary trap. And so that's certainly something worth thinking about. So the size scale of like the binding interaction or folding interaction is on the order of a couple of nanometers. So we're looking at chemical processes that occur on a couple of nanometer length scale, um, the process itself. But then when we do the imaging, of course, we only have uh, diffraction limited resolution. So basically what we're saying is there's a bunch of proteins in that micron squared pixel of the cell that's undergoing a certain kind of dynamics. And there's a bunch of proteins next door, one micron away, that's doing totally different things for some reason. Right? So the chemical processes on a nanometer scale, but the imaging is still just imaging on a micron. Well, because I was scale. concerned about this, this temperature, like how much <laughs> scale is. I mean, at, at that scale, it's not well, well defined, like how you define temperature in this, uh, you know, at the nano scale, because you have photon photon interactions. I mean, you're looking at like a bulk, I guess, like many, like an ensemble, I guess. Of, mm -hmm. of that's right. So the, that's right. So the bottom line is actually, there's still enough. The way the heating, by the way, is done. So what this laser uh, actually does, it operates at a wavelength in, in this example here of 2,000 nanometers. There is a, you know, if you look at the absorption spectrum of water, water is pretty transparent luckily for us, like around 800 nanometers in that region. But once you get further into infrared, there's all kinds of overtones and combination bands, and you see these sorts of peaks, and we're basically sitting on one of these peaks to heat up all the water in the cell. And, there, and even though you know the water is only 70% of the cell, the rest, as I said at the beginning, is all the other stuff that fills up the cell, that's actually enough molecules to provide very good heat equilibration inside the cell. In fact, one of the things that irks us is we want to do experiments where we can be more out of equilibrium and heat like a small subspot and have temperature gradients. It's actually really hard to do that. You heat a little subspot and whoosh, and it tends to spread out pretty quickly. So that's one of the challenges of these experiments is can we actually at some point maybe do subcell programmable temperature profiles, but we have not really been able to, to do that. Um, speaking of which, so here's what the heating laser actually has to do if we want to get quote instantaneous or millisecond or microsecond temperature responses. So let's say I want to do an experiment like the one I showed you schematically before where I'm at a certain temperature, I suddenly jump to another temperature, my protein responds, and then I jump back to my initial temperature and I get the response again. But I want this to be nice and sharp so I have the best time resolution of my response. So uh, <clears throat> basically it won't do any good to have a laser profile that's shaped like a box because of course your system, your cell, it has a certain time constant for heating that depends on what it's uh, um, uh, the size of, uh, of the cell is. It depends on what the things are and how much heat is being deposited. It depends on the thermal flux, you know, what is the diffu thermal diffusion coefficient, all these sorts of things. So that sort of limits how fast you can do things. And the way that we, to some extent anyway, get around that is to get this profile here, for instance, what you actually do is you take your laser and you preheat the cell. Let's say you want to do your experiment around 39 degrees. You keep your microscope stage at a low temperature, like say 10 degrees, cooled, you know, with a thermoelectric cooler. You turn your laser up uh, <coughs> while you do this cooling to keep the temperature at your cells at 39 degrees. Okay? So I've, I'm sort of primed here and I'm sitting at my initial temperature I want to be at. Now what I do is I jump this laser to a really high power and this gives me of course a large rate of heat deposition and so my temperature is going to start shooting up and if I kept it up there my temperature would keep shooting up to 60 degrees or something like that. Okay? So then what I do is after a couple of milliseconds I simply uh, reduce the power level and the combination of that reduction and the rise time ends up actually giving me that step. Likewise if I want to do a step downwards I jump below where I want to go and as it passes the region where I want to end up 
I turn things back on, right? And of course, you all know there's a simple Laplace transform relationship if you know what the response time of your system is to what function do I need up there to make the function that I want down there, okay? And that's basically uh, what we do to create more or less whatever kind of waveform of temperature we actually want inside the cell. So the laser power waveform is not necessarily the same as the temperature waveform that you want to end up with. Uh -huh. So uh, the way we get the transfer function from the cell is by tedious calibration of the cell at various temperatures of lasers with thermocouples, and you know pretty much the way that you would expect. So, uh, and and it is tedious. But but once you've calibrated it and you're not changing your objective size or other parameters of the experiment, you're keeping it, the focusing laser and everything the same. It's quite reliable. You can literally come in one day do your experiment, turn it off, come back the next term, and it'll work exactly the same way when you check the calibration again. That's one of the nice things about this experiment. It's actually a pretty robust experiment because it uses pretty simple diode lasers and things like that. So there is not, uh, you know, it, the whole thing besides buying yourself a microscope fits into a box, you know, that's like maybe this size that has the heating lasers and stuff uh, in it with a simple computer code to control. So let's look at some data of what, it, what actually happens. So here's an image of one of those U2OS cells uh, over on this side here. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a small temperature jump uh, starting at 39 degrees and I think going to 43 probably, so give the cell a slight fever. And you can see my protein at time, you know, here at the beginning, it's all red. It's because this protein is folded, there's energy transfer with nearly 100% efficiency, and so I excite with the blue laser my, my green uh, chromophore, it transfers the energy over to the red one and I get red fluorescence. Okay? And at time zero I'm going to apply a temperature upward jump and cause the proteins in the cell to unfold, and then at 15 seconds I'm going to apply this downwards jump and cause the proteins in the cell to refold. So let me just run this uh, for you. So here we're applying the upward jump. You can see we're going from orange to yellow and eventually to green. And you can see that our reaction is not as fast as our jump, so we can actually time resolve uh, the reaction here. And we're going to jump downwards again and go back through yellow and orange and red. And all the protein inside that cell, that's the labeled protein, is going to refold. By the way, the protein that we labeled, we purposely genetically engineered it so it has a melting temperature around 30 degrees, uh, 38 degrees Celsius. As you can imagine, most proteins in this cell have much higher melting temperatures, like on the order of 50 or the 60 degrees, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to live even at 38 degrees Celsius if our protein started melting at uh, 38 degrees Celsius. That's the idea of putting this probe protein in. And then you can fit this data and look at the kinetics. But actually the most interesting thing in this particular slide isn't what is the time it took and whatever. And, you know, we do worry about details like that because my group is interested in protein dynamics. But actually the fact that the, uh, the uh, measurement goes right back to where it started, uh, meaning the system is acting completely reversibly. Now it turns out, I don't have the data up here, but if you did that same experiment with that protein in a test tube, it would go back to only 80%. So the reaction would not be completely reversible. And the reason is that these proteins, when they unfold, become sticky, right? The, they don't have just the charged residues on the outside anymore. They are exposing these sticky, you know, hydrophobic residues that are normally on the inside of the protein. And then these proteins aggregate. We know all the bad things like Alzheimer's disease and so forth that can happen to you from uh, protein aggregation, right? Um, and so in the test tube, this thing will actually go back to here, but in the cell it goes back 100%. And we shouldn't be too surprised because you know, cells have evolved for billions of years to make sure the proteins fold back with very high efficiency uh, on the inside. Uh, okay, so let me give you a couple then of examples of the kinds of things that we can uh, measure with this in vivo imaging technique and, and look at behavior of uh, proteins and other kinds of molecules inside uh, living cells. So one of the, uh, naturally, if you're doing an experiment where you're applying a temperature programmable heat to a cell, uh, a natural thing to look at is the so-called heat shock response, <laughs> right? Um, so the heat shock response is actually a very interesting thing where it appears that your cells contain a number of proteins that have names like uh, HSP70 or HSP40 or in bacteria DNAK and DNAJ. Uh, whose job it is that when there is a stress on the cell from heat, but it can also come from toxic chemicals or other kinds of things, uh, 
basically, these proteins' job is to bind to other proteins that are about to unfold or beginning to unfold and prevent them from aggregating or sticking to one another, kind of like a rescue operation. And then hopefully, of course, maybe the heat shock is just very brief and the cell will go back down to lower temperature uh, and, and then uh, these proteins can detach and your protein can refold. So that's sort of the general thinking is that these proteins sort of, sort of serve as dock and rescue stations for other proteins uh, when they are subjected to a sudden heat shock. We used to say, this isn't going to really help you if you stick your hand in the frying pan and keep it there because, you know, eventually the damage gets so large that, you know, that, you, know you are going to be irreversible. But for sort of short, temporary shocks, uh, this is a system that can help. And it's called the latent heat shock response system uh, because it... Uh, uh, these proteins already pre-exist in the cell. So you have substrate proteins that might be prone to unfolding and aggregating, which would then kill the cell. Uh, this is generally in, in these neurodegenerative diseases, the reason for cell death is that you form aggregates inside the cell that can kill the cell. Uh, but instead, it's going to bind to these heat shock proteins that basically protect it and either eventually allow it to refold, or if the refolding is just not possible, at least get the protein degraded back into amino acids, which are useful building blocks to make new proteins. I mean, at least you're saving yourself the building blocks instead of just making an aggregated mess. Okay? So, in very simple terms, then, in uh, one of the experiments we can do, instead of what I just showed you, where we had a single protein that was labeled with two labels, let's take this heat shock protein and label it with one of the colors. A enzyme that unfolds very easily, phosphoglycerate kinase, will label it with the other color and we'll apply the heat shock and we want to see if there is actually this threat or energy transfer occurring that indicates that indeed that these proteins are binding to one another and how quickly are they doing it and is this binding reversible? Uh, like, you know, does it maybe bind very quickly? but the unbinding takes longer, all kinds of questions like that that you could ask in the uh, cellular environment. So indeed, when we do our heating experiments, we can image a cell and actually see even differences at the subcellular level. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and and uh, what we find is you know, <coughs> that indeed these uh, proteins that are purported to be heat shock proteins in the cell, that those are the blue curves, will actually bind to your protein as you increase the temperature. So this decreasing number means increased binding. It's basically like decreased red uh, green fluorescence and increased red fluorescence. So again, the green over red uh, ratio. And it turns out we independently measured what the melting temperature with this protein was. So you saw it in the previous slide, it was 39 degrees. And that's indeed where the binding occurs. So basically, uh, these proteins will do something that people call non-specific binding. Right? So as I increase the temperature, there's a little bit of some binding going on, you know, even, and, that, and it does increase, but it only increases linearly. But then the sudden, you know, exponential transition where you get very, you know, uh, strong binding where the curve suddenly bends down uh, occurs at the melting temperature of this protein, where this protein really is beginning to unfold. And just as a test, right, we could, uh, sort of an easy test you could do as an experiment is you make another version of this enzyme that has a melting temperature of 60 degrees or something, you know, way high up, and therefore it shouldn't unfold, you know, when you apply the heat shock to the cell. And so do you then see binding or not? And indeed, when you basically make a stable version of this enzyme shown by the red crosses, what you find actually is that this linear curve simply continues. So there is still sort of non-specific interactions where these proteins sort of explore each other, but this heat shock protein doesn't actually stick to the target protein because the target protein is not unfolding because it's a high melting uh, target protein. And we could look at the dynamics of this, you know, how fast does this process happen? And what you see here is that basically this binding process takes on the order of about half a second to occur. So after you apply your heat shock at time zero here, it takes about half a second to occur. And for higher temperature, you see more of an amplitude. And that's not too surprising. If the thing is doing its job, it should bind more uh, when you go to higher temperatures and your proteins are in more uh, distress. And that time scale here of about half a second uh, is in fact actually limited by the unfolding time scale of that protein. So that protein, I didn't really get into the details of it, but you saw it in those curves in that when I showed you that cell as, uh, where we switched the protein from folded to unfolded, it was about a one second process. So as this protein is basically unfolding, it's immediately recognized by this uh, heat shock docking protein and is held uh, bound inside the cell. Um, you can actually tell things about shapes of proteins. So for instance, 
Uh, this is sort of an interesting question. People spend a lot of time doing a technique called X-ray crystallography, where you take proteins, you make them into crystals, and then you use that to determine what the structure of the protein is. And you get beautiful structures, but they are the structure of the protein in the crystal, and there's the question of, is that actually the same structure the protein has when it's in the cell? Okay. So here's an example where that's definitely not the case. The structure in the cell of the protein is quite different from what you get in the uh, crystal structure. So here's the crystal structure. And what we found by doing these in-cell measurements, and again measuring this donor over acceptor ratio, is that when you do the measurement in vitro, uh, where actually by NMR we get very similar structure to the crystal structure, you get a certain amount of uh, donor to acceptor fluorescence. But when you do the experiment either using a crowding agent that's artificial, uh, like a polymer to crowd the protein, or you put the protein into a live cell to see what happens, you actually find that this fluorescence ratio here is much lower on the order of six instead of uh, maybe 11 or something like that. Okay? And what it actually tells you is that the labels that you've put on the protein must have come much closer to one another uh, than they were in the in vitro in the test tube experiment. And in fact, the other interesting thing that we found for this particular enzyme where we measured this, you know, the picture of which is shown over here, that when you actually crowd this enzyme by putting these polymers around it to crowd it, its enzymatic activity actually increases by a factor of 25. Normally you would actually expect that if you put polymers around things, it should slow down things because, you know, things diffuse more slowly when you have a polymer matrix around them, okay? But it actually speeds up the reaction by a factor of 25. And so why is that? And the reason we think that happens is because the structure of this enzyme inside a living cell is actually quite different from what it is by X-ray crystallography. So here's the X-ray structure, here's what we think it actually looks like. And it turns out a sort of mystery that the X-ray people had is that the active site on this enzyme, which is the part that actually does the chemical reaction, is actually split in two. It has like a binding site for the substrate over here, and then it has a binding site for another substrate over here. And why would you want to keep these apart like that, right? It would actually make more sense to have them together. And in fact, what we think is that the structure of this enzyme inside a living cell actually has these two things just flipped together, okay? So that you put both pieces of the active site right next to one another, and that's what actually accelerates. Uh, the dynamics and we work together with somebody but it's always good to have a computer simulation on your side too so we actually we work with a group that does computer simulations of protein dynamics by molecular dynamics simulation and what they found is that when they <coughs> crowded the protein by adding the same kinds of polymers in their simulation that we add in our experiments that indeed the protein instead of looking like this had this different structure uh, th that uh, presumably will have a much higher enzymatic rate we could look at protein stability and kinetics inside cells, but I already sort of discussed that with the example where I showed you the kinetics and the fact that it refolds nearly 100% at the beginning. We can modulate this. So for instance, if I take a cell and I do something nasty to it, like putting it in a hypotonic solution. So, you know, the cell has a certain content of water and various kinds of salts in it, right? And if I put the cell into a solution that's pure water, uh, it's going to start swelling up, right, through osmosis until eventually it actually will even blow up, okay? And likewise, if I put a cell into to higher concentration of salt, I can get it to shrink. So I can basically modulate the size of the cell uh, by doing that. And so in this particular case, what we did is we measured how quickly a protein folded inside a cell using our instrument. And then we put it into hypotonic media, basically just water, okay? And you can see it actually sped up the folding reaction. And why would that be? Well, it makes perfect sense, right? Again, if the cell is sort of filled with all of the stuff, uh, the friction from all these things is going to somewhat hinder the folding reaction or slow it down. If I add more water in there so things are more widely spaced and more free to move around, I'm going to speed up this folding reaction by making it look a little bit more like it does uh, in the uh, test tube. And so we can manipulate cells like that. In fact, we can measure what the ratio of these uh, 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 rates is, whether you do it in vivo, which is that red curve here, or in cells. So what this plot basically shows you is we've measured the time it takes for the protein to fold in a bunch of different cells and made a histogram of it in blue. And then we measured it in a test tube a bunch of times, the same number of times, and made a histogram in red. And of course, you certainly would expect that the measurements in, in the test tube, it should come out the same every time. Okay? So you should get a nice sharp curve if you have a small measurement uncertainty. And that's what we see here. Whereas from cell to cell, 
you might actually expect either way, right? If all cells are completely identical, you'd expect to have another blue curve that's just as sharply peaked. But of course, if there's a significant amount of variation from one cell to another, you would actually expect to see a broad range of time scales. And that's actually what we observed. So you can see there's a much wider range of time scales of the dynamics of this protein inside a cell than what you measure when you do the experiment uh, in the test tube. And through details that I don't really want to you know, get into, there are sort of two things that could be responsible for this. You know, whenever you have a chemical reaction, right, there's sort of two factors that control the rate. One is how quickly can you get up in energy so you can get over the barrier of the reaction. Right? That's that delta G over here. And the other one is how quickly are things actually moving around. Okay? Because how quickly they actually sample that barrier depends on how quickly they can move to get there. Okay? And in this particular case, we actually showed that it's really not the barrier, it's actually mostly this diffusion coefficient that causes that change in, in rates. So inside cells, things are just more viscous and diffuse more slowly, as, I already, as you could already see from that previous slide, where we have pumped water, basically, into the cell. Uh, here's one more example showing you the variation of dynamics and stability at the organelle level. So inside cells, you, know, you have the cytoplasm, we have a cell nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, there's many other organelles, I'm just showing you those three as an example. And it turns out biochemists have uh, cleverly come up with all kinds of tricks that we can basically put prote a protein specifically only into one of these places, but the same protein, basically. So I can import the protein into the endoplasmic reticulum if I want to look there. I could import it into the cell nucleus if I want to look there, and then see if there are differences in the uh, dynamics. And indeed you do, you do see differences. So for instance, in the cell nucleus, the melting temperature of this protein okay, is significantly higher than it is in the cytoplasm or when you do the experiment in vitro. Okay? So there's something inside the nucleus, and quite frankly, we have no idea what it is right now, in the constituents of the nucleus uh, that actually allows the protein to be uh, more stable. I mean, obviously the nucleus has a lot of negatively charged DNA and other kinds of things in it. It's very different from the cytoplasm, but we don't know right now what it is that actually causes this difference, but we really can't tell the difference between different environments inside the cell, like the endoplasmic reticulum, the cytoplasm, and the nucleus, and characterize them by how proteins behave differently as far as uh, folding times, stabilities or melting temperatures, or other kinds of parameters of the protein are concerned. Okay, so time is actually essentially up, so I'll show you this one here as the last example, and I'll be happy to take some questions if you want. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things you can do is you can actually determine uh, the motion of objects inside the cells because of a flow of microenvironments. So the cytoplasm, of course, is not just like a bag that's kind of sitting still. Okay? There's microtubules in it that form a cytoskeleton, and this is con continuously being re-sculpted and remodeled, allowing to do the cell things like actually moving around, which many cells need to do, migrate, you know, like, like uh, young cells before they differentiate need to be able to migrate in tissues to the, to the right spot. But also actually these things allow the contents of the cell to be stirred up, right? So that the cell doesn't just have to rely on passive diffusion processes to make things happen, right? It can actually actively move things uh, around on its inside. And so we can use this to measure the propagation of these patterns. And the way we do it is we basically just image the cell at, at the subcellular level on our microscope and we look at one of those reactions. You know, here again it's a, uh, a folding reaction that either <coughs> um, occurs quickly or slowly. You know, some, some proteins fold very slowly, some fold more rapidly. And I've color coded that here so the fast folding ones are blue and the slow folding ones are red. Okay? And you can see there's sort of a pattern in the cell where there's places where proteins fold quickly, and there's other places where the same protein at the same temperature, you know, everything is normally the same, uh, folds uh, slowly inside the cell. And then what we do is we just measure this over and over again at different time delays, and this pattern evolves in time. And in this particular case, you find that the uh, mean lifetime for this pattern is approximately 70 seconds. And that's actually because of the transport of microenvironments inside the cell uh, because of the uh, a cytoskeleton sort of being re-sculpted and remodeling things uh, inside the cell. So I'm not going to go through, I mean, I had one more example, but, you know, I, again, I could go on and on with examples, but the point that I want to make here is simply that, uh, you, know, you know, biomolecules like proteins or other things like RNAs and so forth that people can study in the future have these energy landscapes that have different 
energy minima, and a lot of signaling. You know, signaling is just switching, right? You have a zero and a one state. So you have a zero state on one side of the barrier, and you have a one state on the other side. Or if you're doing an enzymatic reaction, chemical reactions are the same thing. You have a reactant and a product, right? So the, the things that chemists like to call reactant and a product, the computer scientist likes to call zero and one. But it's basically the same idea. And both of them play a role in living systems because there's, of course, information uh, manipulation going on, as well as just metabolism, you know, reactions to produce energy and, and things like that, even though they're not themselves necessarily. The information is not the most important aspect. And what we find is that when we look at biomolecules inside living systems, that are, the living system actually does have uh, does modulate the, this energy landscape, you know, causing some of these energies to go up and some to go down to control the switching and to control these reactions. And even though these energy differences are relatively small, uh, you know, they, they correspond, as I said, to energies just on the order of a few kT units, you know, a few times room temperature, most in these fluctuations that you can get. Uh, nonetheless, you know, you get a factor of 2.7 for every one of those KTs, and by the time you have three or four KTs, you can have a reaction go from 5% to 95%, and those kinds of differences can make a huge difference and a huge impact in how uh, things behave in the living environment versus, let's say, you know, if you had just looked at it uh, in the test tube. So I'll leave you with that uh, slide, and I'd be happy to take any more questions. And then we go for lunch. <laughs> Boy, was I that clear. <laughs> uh -huh. No, so it's heterogeneous, right? In the sense that, uh, like if you look at, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll put up that one slide here one more time, right? So. You know, the, the, the same, pro it is, it's, it's homogeneous in the sense that we, it's only one kind of protein we're looking at, right? But the protein behaves differently in these different environments inside the cell. So the, the cell has compartments in it, but even within a given compartment, like all of this is in the cytoplasm, uh, the cell actually manages to temporarily encapsulate proteins in places between other macromolecules that basically changes the local environment enough so these proteins will behave differently. So the cell can actually exert control over its contents by modulating the energy. Uh, the smallest concentration, is, as he was asking at the beginning, we can actually look at uh, concentrations down to 50 proteins per element. And I could have, I mean, I don't have the slides here, but one of the things that we do is actually to do what people call correlation or fluctuation spectroscopy, which is an idea very similar to single molecule spectroscopy, except instead of doing it with one molecule, you do it with 20 molecules or something like that, right? So for instance, uh, one of the things that you find as then when you look at a small set of molecules, like say 50 molecules, that there are fluctuations in both the folding and these molecules translating back and forth between, or diffusing back and forth between different environments. And you can extract from the nature of these fluctuations what actually, for instance, the competition between diffusing and folding is. Um, and so you, it may even be possible in the relatively near future to do these kinds of experiments all the way down to a single molecule in a living cell I'll tell you what the sort of technological holdup is right now, but I think we'll actually get around it in the next uh, year or two. Um, basically, uh, right now we are labeling our proteins to look at fluorescence, okay? And of course, if you're gonna look at just one molecule, there better not be a whole lot of background fluorescence you know, messing you up. But it turns out cells do autofluoresce, right? They contain all kinds of molecules like flavines and other sorts of things that will absorb light and that will fluoresce. Most of them don't fluoresce a whole lot, but, but still, you know, it's, it's one molecule versus the whole cell, right? And so what people are trying to develop right now is basically labeling technology that allows you to push these labels further down into the infrared, okay? And the autofluorescence of cells is extremely low uh, in the infrared. I mean, you know, we, we all know that, that uh, phenomena like sp spontaneous emission like to go as lambda cubed, you know. And so by pushing things towards the red, uh, we think that we can actually get the background turned off sufficiently that we might even be able to look at single molecules in a live cell. Any other questions? Then I thank you for your attention. We can chow down.